I was there when this extradition treaty was reached. It was concluded behind the backs of Parliament during the summer recess when no member of Parliament could question the treaty which David Blunkett, Tony Blair's Home Secretary, corruptly and secretly concluded with the United States a one-sided extradition treaty the likes of which no free country would ever sign with any other country, where well, they'd never have to send anybody to us, whatever they've done, even if it's killing a young boy on a motorway because you're driving up the wrong side of the road. You don't have to send anybody to us. But we will send anybody to you without even just cause having to be produced. But when Parliament returned in the autumn, I bearded David Blunkett in the members' lobby and told him all the things that I thought were wrong and dangerous with this extradition treaty. And he said to me, you're worrying unnecessarily because all of the points you're making are taken care of by Article 4.1 of the treaty which precludes the extradition of people in Britain for political offenses to the United States. And now the judge is telling us that although that's on the face of the treaty, it does not apply. What madness is this? If we allow Julian Assange to be sent for the rest of his life, the rest of his life, into the dungeons of the US injustice system, journalism, freedom, freedom of speech, democracy itself will have been murdered in plain sight on our watch. And that's why we are going to fight and fight and fight again to free Julian Assange. Free Julian Assange. Get out your notebook. There's more. Welcome to CN Live, Season 6, Episode 5, The Assange Dilemma for the United States. I'm Joe Loria, Editor-in-Chief of Consortium News. And I'm Elizabeth Voss. The High Court's ruling on Tuesday in London has posed a dilemma for the Biden administration. It must provide written assurances to Britain that it will respect Julian Assange's First Amendment rights if it wants to have him extradited to the U.S. as early as next month. Without that assurance, the High Court said it would allow Assange to appeal the Home Office's extradition order on three grounds related to his First Amendment rights and protection against the death penalty. If the U.S. wants him now, it must promise to allow him those rights. Otherwise, it will have to battle it out in an appeals process that will drag on for at least another year or more. The Biden Department of Justice Thus, must weigh the pros and cons of delivering the assurances on the First Amendment and the death penalty by April 16 to have him extradited or miss the deadline and go through with fighting the appeal. Allowing Assange his First Amendment rights, which the U.S. has threatened to deprive him of, could possibly become part of his defense at trial and perhaps set up a constitutional challenge of the Espionage Act, under which Assange is being charged, and which clearly conflicts with protected speech. After the U.S. lost the initial judgment in the lower court in January 2021, barring Assange's extradition based on his health and the conditions of U.S. prisons, the court allowed the U.S. to issue written assurances that it would not mistreat Assange in custody. These were conditional on Assange's behavior, however. Amnesty International said the assurances were not worth the paper they were written on. Nevertheless, the High Court accepted those assurances carte blanche without allowing Assange's lawyer to, lawyers to challenge their validity in court and overturned the ruling barring extradition. The UK Supreme Court then refused Assange's application to challenge the assurances and the case went to the Home Secretary, who promptly signed the extradition order. 
Assange is now trying to appeal that order. His application for appeal will most likely be denied by the high court if the U.S. delivers on the assurances. It was the same high court, though with, with different judges, that accepted the U.S. assurances without challenge the first time. One thing is different this time, however. The High Court on Tuesday ruled that Assange's lawyers will be able to challenge the credibility of U.S. assurances in written submissions. The U.S. would then have two weeks to respond in writing to those challenges, though it may, might seem unlikely given the bias shown towards the U.S. by British judges so far in this case, there is an outside chance that the U.S. assurances would be thrown out. Presuming that they aren't, Assange could then be on a plane to the, U to the U.S. on May 20, the preliminary date for a hearing on this matter, barring a last-minute in intervention by the European Court of Human Rights. So would it be better, would it better serve Biden's interest to miss the April 16 deadline for the assurances in order to keep Assange in Belmarsh a while longer, despite the risk that the U.S. could lose on appeal? The last thing Biden needs in the midst of his re-election campaign is to have a journalist arrive on American shores in chains to stand trial outside Washington for publishing true information about U.S. state crimes. Donald Trump, whose administration had Assange arrested, indicted, and thrown into Belmarsh, would most likely hypocritically make much out of Biden prosecuting a journalist. Trump would understand that some voters who support Assange might switch their support to him, and that his own base is made up of libertarians who support Assange's constitutional rights. So it might be very much in Biden's interest to miss the deadline for the assurances to prevent Assange from coming to the U.S. before the election, even though the 66-page ruling by two high court judges uh, on Tuesday was in most ways favorable to the United States. For instance, the court on Tuesday rejected outright the most substantive and significant points raised by Assange's barristers at a two-day hearing heard on February 20th and 21st. It rejected six grounds in all. The argument that the Home Secretary's extradition order was incompatible with the U.S.-U.K. extradition treaty that bars extradition for political offenses. The High Court also rejected that Assange was being prosecuted for his political opinions in violation of the U.K.-U.S. extradition act. These two points would mean that Assange's revelations of U.S. war crimes is now irrelevant in, to his case, as the court does not find his case to be political. Significantly, Tuesday's ruling did not allow Assange to introduce new evidence in the case that came to light after the lower court ruling, namely that the CIA plotted to kidnap and assassinate Assange from the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where he had had asylum before being arrested and thrown into Belmarsh prison, where he continues to languish. In the middle of this came word last week from the Wall Street Journal that U.S. prosecutors and Assange's lawyers have discussed the parameters of a possible plea deal, though it seems those talks have stalled. Constitutional lawyer Bruce Afrin, who was one of our guests on today's show, last August told CN Live that Assange could plead guilty to mishandling classified information, a misdemeanor, with a maximum penalty of five years, which happens to be how long uh, Julian Assange has served already in Belmarsh on remand, and that he could and should enter the pleas remotely from London and not go to the U.S. to do it, where the U.S. could change its mind once he got there. Joining Bruce Afron on today's program is Marjorie Cohn, a law professor and former president of the National Lawyers Guild, Craig Murray, a former British ambassador, was close to Julian Assange, and Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Chris Hedges. Welcome, everybody, and thanks for coming. Marjorie, let's start with you, since we know you have to go to another meeting after this. Could you just first give me your, uh, your quick take on the ruling on Tuesday as you read it? Well... A difference here between this ruling and the last time that Elizabeth mentioned that the U.S. provided assurances that Assange would be treated humanely if extradited to the United States is that these assurances, the high court panel said, have to be satisfactory. And so they would, if the Biden administration came through with a um, with assurances, then there would be a hearing and on whether they're satisfactory and the defense Assange's legal team would be able to challenge that now in terms of the there the, the three issues the um uh do you want me to go through the three issues or do you want me to yes. just yes yes yeah. yes okay. okay all right um i do want to say that uh the earlier stage when these assurances were provided by the US um and they were accepted 
without any at face value by the high court and the high court reversed the the uh, denial of extradition that the lower court had ordered based on humane grounds. Um, they didn't really deal with the fact that the U.S. actually has a history of reneging on similar assurances. The U.S. lies. They say, yes, we'll ensure humane treatment. And this happened in a case with a person in Spain who was extradited to the United States uh, after U.S. gave assurances um, and, and those assurances were violated. Um, one of the things that the panel said in this in this recent decision is um, that there is an opportunity to challenge these assurances if the U.S. comes forward with them. Quote, Mr. Assange will not therefore be extradited immediately, unquote. That implies to me that um, that he, he if in, in the absence uh, of that uh, of that um, claim, then he would be extradited immediately. He would immediately be put on a plane. Um, and so briefly, the three grounds that Assange is allowed to raise on appeal, assuming that Biden doesn't come forward with assurances or those assurances are not satisfactory, is first of all, um, his right to freedom of expression under Article 10 of the Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights, would be violated um, because he would be denied to the ability to raise the First Amendment in his trial. And they, the panel said the First Amendment is very similar to Article 10 of the European Convention. Um, Gordon Cromberg, who is a prosecutor who would be prosecuting Assange if he were extradited, um, said that foreign nationals are not entitled to protections of the First Amendment. Mike Pompeo, former CIA director, said that Assange has no First Amendment freedoms because he's not a U.S. citizen. And the Supreme Court ruled in 2020 that foreign citizens outside the U.S. territory don't possess rights under the Constitution. Um, and but let's assume that the U.S. that Biden, the Biden administration does give assurances that his he would be able to raise the First Amendment um, and, and, the, and that the court found that those were significant assurances. Um, that really doesn't mean anything, because one of the things that the British courts don't understand is the U.S. doctrine of separation of powers. I mean, we're just dealing here with the executive branch. The prosecutors can give all the assurances they want. Um, but the the judiciary, another one of these three branches of government in the U.S., doesn't have to abide by um, the executive branch claim or assurance. Um, so the, the and, and one of the things that the high courts, the uh, panel on the high court said is that Assange would argue at trial that his actions are protected by the First Amendment. Quote, he contends that if he's given First Amendment rights, the prosecution will be stopped. The First Amendment is therefore of central importance to his defense. And so that's why they are giving uh, Assange another shot at possibly raising this issue on appeal, the uh, First Amendment issue. Then the second issue, um, the UK Extradition Act forbids discrimination based on nationality. Julian Assange is an Australian citizen. If he's extradited to the US, he would be tried in US courts. And the Extradition Act bars extradition if an individual might be prejudiced due to his nationality and due to the centrality of his first of the First Amendment to his defense, the panel noted, if he's not permitted to rely on the First Amendment because of his status as a foreign national, he'll thereby be prejudiced, potentially very greatly prejudiced by reason of his nationality. That's the second issue. The third issue is that um, there are inadequate safeguards or assurances that he wouldn't be sentenced to death if he was sent to the U.S. The extradition, U.K. Extradition Act, says that the Secretary of State, this is in the U.K., must not order a person's extradition if he could be, will be, or has been sentenced to death unless there's a written assurance that's adequate that says that a sentence of death either will not be imposed or will not be carried out if imposed. Now, none of the charges that Julian Assange is facing right now carry the death penalty, but he could be extradited to the U.S. and then charged with aiding and abetting treason or espionage, both of which carry the death penalty. And Ben Watson, KC, who's the Secretary of State for the U.K. Home Department, admitted the facts alleged against Assange could sustain a charge of aiding or abetting treason or espionage, and that if he's extradited, there's nothing to prevent a charge of aiding or abetting treason or a charge of espionage from being added to the indictment. And the death penalty is available for those two crimes. 
Um, now, Donald Trump, you know, it's hard to know uh, what he's going to say at any given time. But when he was asked the, when he was before he became president about WikiLeaks leaking the documents, he said, this is Donald Trump, quote, I think it was disgraceful. I think there should be a death penalty or something, unquote. Now, the president of the United States is not supposed to control the Department of Justice. They're supposed to be independent. But Donald Trump doesn't follow those rules. And so he could, if Julian Assange is extradited, if Trump is elected president, he could prevail upon the Justice Department to add one of those charges that would make him uh, eligible for the death penalty, regardless of any assurances that the Biden Justice Department gives. Um, and so... Um, the, there is a possibility that, in, and Joe kind of alluded to this in a different way, um, that instead of filing assurances, the Biden administration will opt to avoid the political pitfalls of Assange being extradited to the U.S. before the election and actually offer a plea bargain um, with credit for time served to end the case. Right. So, so uh, before we, we move on to Craig, thank you for that. Uh, I want to ask you, what are the standards that the court, these two judges will use to judge whether these assurances are satisfactory. I should note that it's very significant that these judges are at least giving Assange's lawyers the right to challenge the validity and the credibility of the assurance, which they were not given that right the first time when the high court accepted those assurances, uh, as you say, carte blanche. What are the uh, standards that, the, obviously they're gonna look at the language. The language in those other assurances was very conditional. What will they be looking for, Marjorie? Well, this whole idea of what, what significant assurances are, what is significant, I mean, is very subjective. And uh, it, it, there, there's really, I don't think there's any clear standard, clear and convincing evidence or beyond a reasonable doubt or anything like that that I know of. And so it's really going to come down to the subjective views of the high court judges at that hearing, assuming Biden pre presents any assurances, about whether or not those assurances are satisfactory. And, and I, I hope and and uh, suspect and am com pretty confident that the Assange defense will argue that there is a separation of powers um, doctrine in the United States, which means that regardless of what assurances the executive branch through the Department of Justice, the prosecutors provide, whether they are significant or not, um, are, are not worth the paper that they're written on because the judiciary, a separate branch of government, can overrule them. So Marjorie, but I know you have to go, so I'm going to ask you one more before we move on to Craig. How reluctant do you think the Biden uh, DOJ will be to allow the First Amendment rights to Julian Assange? How crucial would that be in his defense? And would it also possibly set up a challenge of the constitutionality of the Espionage Act? Because this seems very significant that they are demanding that the U.S. promise that they allow him these First Amendment rights. They could certainly, at trial, if it goes to Alexandria, could say that uh use that can his lawyers assange's lawyers use that yes certainly the first amendment goes to the heart of julian assange's defense if he has the right to free expression um and and freedom of speech then uh what he did would would uh what he what he's accused of doing would not violate the law so it's very central to his defense as the high court panel noted and for that reason, it's probably likely that the prosecution is going to argue, consistent with what the Supreme Court has said, uh, that foreign nationals don't have a, uh, a, a constitutional rights. Um, so I think I think that that is really a critical argument. And I think you're right, Joe. I think it very likely could set up a challenge to the uh, ex to the um, Espionage Act that it's unconstitutional. They, they won't, sorry, they won't get him if they don't promise that he has those rights, though. I mean, this That's is true. A they, but again, they can promise anything they want, and that doesn't mean they won't go back on it. They won't renew right. on it. Okay. All right. I was afraid you were going to say that. Craig, can you weigh in on this, your general thoughts, and then respond to anything that we said in our opening and to Marjorie? Um, the first significant point is that it's not true that they won't necessarily get him unless they provide the significant assurances, because there's another phase. What the court has said is that he has the right to appeal on these points unless assurances are received. Uh, if those assurances are received, his right to appeal falls and is extradited if, if the court considers the assurances sufficient. If the assurances 
are not sufficient, it doesn't mean he's not extradited. It means he has a right to appeal those points. Right. right. There's then a hearing substantively on those points and whether they're strong enough to prevent the extradition. So it's perfectly possible, for example, that on his right to rely on the First Amendment, um, that the assurances as to no discrimination by nationality are not satisfactory, Therefore, he's allowed to appeal on that point. But at the substantive hearing at that point, they come to uh, a decision that that wasn't a strong enough point to stop the entire extradition. So the assurances could fail and he could still be extradited. Uh, and I think it's very important to, um, uh, to, to realise that. And I can actually see that happening. I can see the uh, prosecution uh, arguing that, well, no, we can't because it's up to the judge we cannot give a firm assurance. We can assure, for example, the prosecution won't raise the point, but that still doesn't mean the judge isn't going to follow that Supreme Court decision in USA versus Open Society and, and rule he doesn't have those rights. Uh, but we can promise the prosecution won't press for it, but we can't bind the judge. But we are a democracy where the United States, the United Kingdom's ally, we're a category two power under the Extradition Act as a safe place to go. We believe in the rule of law. You can safely lead this to the judge. The judge will give it a fair hearing and a fair decision. And the court may say, yeah, that, that's OK. But it's not any definite discrimination by nationality here. Or they could argue it's not discrimination by nationality as such. Every country treats non-citizens and citizens in a different way when outside the country as regards consular protection and all kinds of things. So this is not an unusual discrimination by nationality. There are all kinds of arguments they can put forward, which, which frankly aren't very strong, but which the court can decide to, to accept even in the absence of assurances. And given some of the crazy things they've accepted so far, like the idea that the no political offences, um, uh, the idea that the no political offences um, uh, bar in the treaty doesn't apply because it's not been incorporated into UK domestic law, for example, um, and I wouldn't put it at all past them um, to stretch to, to saying, OK, they couldn't provide that assurance, but nonetheless, the appeal doesn't succeed on that point once it's actually heard in the substantive hearing on the 20th of May. Um, I think that it's actually very surprising that no assurance has been given on the death penalty because that's absolutely routine. It happens in loads of extraditions. It's normal. It's a template. It's taken two minutes to do it. Uh, uh, they're very used to, to, to doing that. And there's no reason not to give it, bluntly. They actually don't want to execute Julian. Uh, they want to keep him entombed for life uh, in, and incarcerated in, in, in a kind of slow death in which he's a warning to other journalists as opposed to providing a martyr through execution. So they could easily give that assurance. And the fact they haven't given that assurance, I think, is strong evidence um, that um, I, I think is strong evidence that they are trying to just spin it out until after the election. But the assurance on the death penalty is different. The assurance I said they could not give a satisfactory assurance against nationality by discrimination, but the, the court could then still rule that isn't actually nationality by discrimination and still let him be extradited. The assurance on the death penalty is in a different category. You absolutely cannot extradite without the assurance on the death penalty. So they have to give that one, and they will give it by the deadline. They'll go right up to the deadline, but they will give it on the deadline, I'm sure. That one, that one will be given. And one last point, um, I'm never... I could talk for hours, but, but there are many other people want to talk. One last point is, you know, the significance of saying that the treaty that the treaty provision against political offences does not apply, because the, the judgment makes it absolutely plain that, that that applies to all the 156 extradition treaties which the UK has, uh, which, which bar political extradition for political offence. So what they're saying is, you know, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Russia, China, you have dissidents here, come and get them, because we are not going to apply the uh, the no political extra offence extradition, uh, the extradition uh, provision of, of any of those treaties. Uh, and the ramifications of that are, you know, <laughs> are, are many of the, the horrible ramifications for freedom in, in, in this case as a whole.
Thank you. Um, we'll come back to you, Craig. Chris, Chris Hedges. Well, I think we have to remember that the extradition request was only pushed forward uh, after the uh, exposure of the Vault 7 documents, which exposed the CIA's ability to hack into our phones, computers, cars, uh, and use them as listening recording devices, even when they're turned off. And, uh, and so I think it's uh, a very probable that if, uh, and, and of course, this is not part of the uh, extradition request, but I think it's very probable that if he is extradited, uh, those charges will be added to the indictment. So the engine behind this is clearly the CIA. Uh, and they, uh, they have a vested interest in seeing that Julian is punished for this security breach. That's when you got the uh, statements by uh, then CIA Director Mike Pompeo that WikiLeaks is a hostile intelligence uh, agency. I can, I'm mauling the quote a little bit. But, uh, and we have to remember that that's the, that's the engine driving this. It, it's not coming out of the Biden White House. Of course, it was Trump who uh, demanded the extradition. It is really coming out of the CIA. Uh, and, and I think much of what happens to Julian is going to be colored by the character of the CIA. The CIA is, in essence, not an intelligence gathering uh, agency. It's a paramilitary force. It's, that's primarily what it does. That's why they discussed assassinating or kidnapping Julian, because that's what they do. That's what they know how to do. That's what they do all over the globe. Uh, and I think that that factor is is very important because uh, that uh, you know the 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 CIA is not crossed by any elected official. Diane Feinstein tried to do that, and it it didn't uh, when this was on the torture uh, because they're running black sites and were torturing. And I'll always remember that press conference where she walked out very ashen, uh, and they had like tapped into her computers, and I mean they. They sabotage the entire investigation, uh, and uh, Feinstein, who's no flaming liberal, frankly, uh, was appalled uh, that and said, "You know, you can't." I can't remember the exact words, but it was something like, "You cannot cross these people." So, this is an extremely important uh, factor in what's happening to Julian, and I think that we can be very sure that the impetus uh, behind the extradition. And the uh, the demands for extradition uh, supersede uh, the Democratic Party uh, and come out of the intelligence agency. And there's no question that if extradited, he will be hit with those charges for Vol. Seven, which right now are not part of the indictment. So uh, that that you know makes me very pessimistic about Julian's chances because uh, I think the the CIA uh, is determined. Uh, to uh, make him pay uh, as a kind of example. Uh, and so we're not really talking about the Iraqi war logs anymore. We're not talking about the Podesta emails. We're talking about something in the eyes of, uh, you know, the, 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 the power, the, especially the deep state power, something far, far, far more serious. And, uh, and that's why I, 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 you know, is it, is it advantageous? For Biden uh, to keep him uh, locked up in Belmarsh, of course, uh, but I don't think it's I don't think Biden's driving this. Mm. Why do you think they didn't uh, put that into the? Briefly to that, Joe. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, in 2017, it wasn't just the CIA. Donald Trump himself personally asked for options to kidnap and/or kill Julian Assange. Um, so, Chris, why didn't Donald Trump's administration in 2017, 2018, when they uh, indicted Julian Assange for the war crimes he, that WikiLeaks exposed in 2010, 2011, why didn't they include those Vault 7 charges then? I mean, that's a that's a good question, I, I and I which, of course, I can't answer. Uh, why didn't they include them? I don't I don't think they needed them. Uh, they they uh, they already had. Uh, a kind of process in place uh, by which they could charge him. 
I, I think it, I think there's no question that if he was extradited, the exposure of Vault Seven would be added. I, I just don't see how that's. Uh, but but why they didn't do it? I, I, probably because they didn't need to. I wonder. Do they? Uh, the Espionage Act does carry a death penalty in time of war. Isn't that correct? Or am I wrong there? Am I yes. confusing that with treason? It does. So um, I don't know. Why would the uh, because. Marjorie said earlier he'd have to have other charges. I think it was Marjorie that we have to have other charges added he's when he gets. He's not charged with espionage per se. He's charged with offenses under the Espionage Act, right. but he's not charged with espionage. If he was charged with espionage, then it would carry the death penalty. I see. Okay, Bruce Afrin. Bruce was um, way ahead of the game on this plea uh, deal, and he told us back in August last year that uh, Julian could. Uh, plead guilty to mishandling official information or classified information. Uh, that's a five-year maximum term, and he's already served those five years in Belmarsh. And he also said that, um, uh, what did he say? He said that uh, that he could remotely do this plea, this plea from here in London rather than going back to the U.S. where the U.S. could change their mind. So, Bruce, I want you first, if you want to weigh in on what we've been discussing, uh, your reading, because you read the the 66-page ruling. What is your overall assessment? Then I want to talk to you about the plea deal. Because you were ahead of the okay. game there. Sure. Uh, thanks, Joe. I think the decision was very predictable once the U.S. representative conceded that they can't control the death penalty in this case. Obviously, U.K. law bars extradition if the death penalty is available. And it was a rather extraordinary thing for the U.S. representative to say, well, if the Trump administration comes into office, they may seek the death penalty based on new charges, similar to what Chris is alluding to. And to me, that was an extraordinary concession, probably unnecessary because it's somewhat speculative. And I read it as the Biden administration trying to get a denial of extradition to get off the hook, so to speak. Uh, Australia is pushing heavily for Julian to be sent back home. Australia is a critical U.S. defense ally. And I'm reading it a little differently. I'm reading it that that concession was made to set up the basis for a denial by the court in the U.K. Because clearly, if the death penalty is available, there can be no extradition. And it looks to me, and the decision was very predictable once that concession was made. So I, I see it as the U.S. is trying to kind of get out of a difficult position by making the very concession that would block extradition. Uh, with respect to it, first of all, there's no way anyone can guarantee there won't be a death penalty sought. Clearly, a future Justice Department could do that. By the time Julian were actually extradited, process, given pretrial proceedings, there's still plenty of time for a Trump administration to do just that, seek the death penalty on new charges. So there's no way to guarantee against it. I think that concession was right. I think it was also offered to, to have a legal way out of this problem. With regard to the First Amendment, I, I think, as Marjorie said, you know, the, the whole concept of an assurance ignores the separation of powers. You know, that's very correct. I mean, clearly, no administration representative, whether it's a UK lawyer or an American lawyer, can say that a court is going to respect First Amendment defenses in charges of this nature. It's up to the court to make that decision. And we're in a very novel area of law. Journalists have never been prosecuted before for this type of issue. Julian certainly falls arguably in the category of a journalist. So does WikiLeaks. And... There's no way to predict whether First Amendment defenses will be allowed. I mean, the, the court itself made the point that on its face anyway, he's not being prosecuted in the U.S. for speech violations, but rather for the taking of data illegally or information illegally. So right there, there's an issue. Will the First Amendment ever be respected in this case? There's absolutely no way any assurance let alone what the court wants, a significant assurance can be given. No administration can guarantee that. And we're in a field of law never explored before in the U.S. And there's absolutely no way one can argue that the First Amendment defense will be allowed, give, forgetting entirely whether a foreign national can assert those, those rights. 
And if Julian's actions occurred outside the U.S., there is an argument that the First Amendment wouldn't have applied in the first place. However, part of Julian's actions occurred while he was in the U.S., and the First Amendment ob logically should apply no matter what. But there's no way to guarantee what a court will say in an unusual situation like this. Dan Ellsberg was prosecuted for similar offenses, but not the New York Times, not the Washington Post. So we have no knowledge based on any precedent whether the First Amendment will be respected. So my gut feeling is in May, there's going to be no capacity to give a significant assurance on either actually, ground. Frankly. Actually, Nixon administration impaneled the grand jury in Boston to indict Neil Sheehan and the other Times reporters, and it fell through because they discovered it was discovered that they had FBI had wiretapped Ellsberg's phone. So the reporters came forward and said, "Wait a minute, we were talking on the phone, so you were wiretapping us too." That's how that collapsed. So there have been attempts, including by FDR during the Second World War. The Chicago Tribune published some cables that uh, Japan had uh, that unencry unencrypted cables from Japan on the Midway incident. Uh, so, but this is the first successful prosecution. Given what you we said, no, Bruce, we have no that, case law allowing it. There's no case. No, it didn't happen. Right. There was no indictment. They tried, but it didn't. This is the first time someone's been indicted. Given what you said about the U.S. trying to get uh, Biden or the U.S. administration trying to get out of this, what does that say about a possible police still being a valid possibility just in the middle of all of this with the high court? Because that still happened. Right. Well, let me just say this. Obviously, what I'm saying differs somewhat from what Chris was saying. Uh, uh -huh. Because Chris is suggesting, you know, there's an intelligence community imperative at work. You know, there could be. But I think there's also a political or diplomatic imperative at work in which the administration is trying to get out of that vice. You know, the intelligence community wants this. I think the administration is looking for a way around it. And that's why they gave these concessions in the court in Britain. Um, with regard to a plea, Julian is not really a fugitive. He was in the U.S., he announced what he was doing. He stuck around for a while. Nobody launched charges against him. And he left. He's not an American. He has no duty to come back. So he doesn't really meet the standard of being a fugitive. So that's not going to bar a remote plea. And it's a concept no one's really paid attention to. Julian has the ability to do a remote plea. And it is absolutely permitted by the rules, not usually done, but he can do it. A conspiracy to... Um, mishandle or aid in the mishandling of protected information carries a five-year term. He's already served five years. The plea can be entered, time served can be represented, and he goes off to Australia. Uh, I assume the, the Brits don't want him there anymore, so I think he'd be going to Australia. There's absolutely nothing barring that plea. And um, it would make sense. It would at least achieve the legal message the government wanted, or at least the Trump administration wanted, and it would get the U.S. out of a difficult diplomatic and political problem. I got to point out, if Julian is prosecuted, it creates a storm under the Constitution. And it's uncontrollable, and no one knows where it will go. So I think the government has every incentive to try to set it up so that there is pressure to do a plea, and likely lose the extradition hearing at the same time. He, he would have to plead to a conspiracy to mishandle classified material with Chelsea Manning? Is that's that one right? charge. That could, that's one charge. And yeah. um, he could plead to aiding and abetting someone else to do that. You don't need the conspiracy charge necessarily. But all of that would carry prison time equal to what he served. And uh, there's a very simple solution. He's already served five years in prison. Well, let's not forget that that all we need is the conviction. And so since I think a judge is not likely to give him more time than that anyway, uh, this is a solution that should satisfy everyone. And I have to agree, Julian should not come back to the US. Our prison system cannot be trusted to behave gently in this situation. Uh, Let me Jonathan just Pollard's one... experience, for example, was rough, and Julian will be in the same category. I just wanna make one point, and I think Joe would back this up is that that, that uh, posits that the uh, decision by the prosecution not to offer those guarantees was intentional. Uh, yeah. and, I, and I think one of the things that struck uh, Joe, uh, Craig, myself, who sat through the two days of hearings was how uh, amateurish and ill-informed and sloppy 
the prosecution was. In fact, uh, at, at one point they were simply reading an affidavit by Gordon Cromberg from 2020, uh, making all sorts of accusations that had already been uh, disproved. So uh, it does come down to intent. And I'm not 100% I'll let Joe and Craig, because they were both there, I, I didn't walk away that, that the prosecution, after listening to them for two full days, completely knew what they were doing. Well, the absence well, of there. James Lewis was, uh, sorry, I just, I just want to, the absence of James Lewis, a far more uh, experienced prosecutor, well, really did show up. Sorry, Bruce. Yeah, well, I wasn't there, obviously. I don't have that insight on it. But just reading the reports afterwards, I was struck as a lawyer by that concession. It's the one thing that would guarantee the inability of the British court to do this. And by the way, the British probably don't want to tick off the Australians too much either. So it, it almost, to my mind, maybe amateurism is the answer. They were not looking to forcefully defend their case. That's just how I read it as an observer who saw the reports on that concession. It's just, it struck me as a lawyer that way, that you don't make that admission unless you're trying to get out of the problem. Right. Craig, do you I want to add something? Say, yeah. I think on the diplomatic assurances, um, I mean, you've got to remember that there's nothing, if you like, special about the case of, of Julian Assange in this sense, that if you're saying, well, the uh, administration can't guarantee the behavior of any future administration, well, that's true in any case. And if you're saying we can't guarantee the behavior of the courts, that's true in any case. And the United States regularly gives guarantees against the death sentence and, and to the UK and to other European powers, because almost all of Europe, it has to give that kind of guarantee before it can extradite any serious criminal. Um, so uh, it, it's never stopped them before, and it would stop all of them. It, 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 you know, the point you make would stop them ever doing it again and ever being able to extradite a serious criminal from the US again. So they're not going to stick with that. There will be a guarantee against the death penalty. I, I'm, I'm sure it will come in at the last minute. Uh, I could be wrong. We will see. But And, and the other thing, point I want to make is this: the diplomatic assurances thing, there, there's, there's a big legal literature on it. If you, if you Google the weight of diplomatic assurances, in the UK in particular, there's a big legal literature on And again, it's not only the United States. The United Kingdom receives diplomatic assurances that it won't mistreat people from Saudi Arabia and from Jordan and from all kinds of countries where everybody knows that this is nonsense and these have no weight whatsoever. But they are accepted because otherwise we'd never be able to extradite anyone. That's the way the courts look at it. And the and they actually state it was stated in court and stated by the judges, and I believe it's stated in this judgment. It was certainly stated in Beretz's judgment uh, that the extradite that assurances by the extraditing country must be taken in good faith. That the, the the good faith of the state with which you have an extradition treaty has to be the fundamental assumption. And that's it was earlier asked how the court will deal with it. And and the court will give any balance of doubt it can to um uh to the united states and i say it's a worldwide thing uh, I, I mean there are literally hundreds of examples of state that there's an awful one in jordan where they gave assurances they wouldn't mistreat someone and then they tortured them to death so it, it's a regular problem and everyone knows these assurances are meaningless but they are nonetheless a, a very controversial fiction in 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 our legal system of which the courts are very fond, and they're not going to be abandoned in this case. I think I think I'd agree with that. But on the First Amendment issue, I don't see how any assurance could possibly be given as a matter of law in the U.S. There's no way to say a court will accept such defenses, because on its face, the law doesn't recognize the First Amendment defenses. And so I, I think you're right. The diplomatic assurances are routinely given. But here, the, the assurance of an actual defense under the Constitution I don't think could be given. Uh, but to Craig's point, that's absolutely right. They always say the death penalty won't be given. And that's why it struck me as so incredible that they said we can't guarantee it this time. And that, that's why I took the position I did, that, that normally they do say that. And all of a sudden, they can't. 
uh, it seems to me they're they're setting it up for a fall, so to speak, and that solves an immense problem for everybody. Elizabeth, you have some questions, I believe. Sure. Yeah, Chris, I I, I liked your article and, and especially your point you made earlier about the CIA being the engine behind this persecution of Assange. And I just wanted to ask you to comment on the judges prohibiting the submission of new evidence relating to the CIA's plan to kidnap or assassinate Assange after they had already spied on private meetings with his lawyers, his doctors, and practically everyone who visited him. Well, they dismissed it because it was journalism. Uh, it wasn't like they had an internal document. Um, and, you know, what they, those three points that they have allowed him to pursue are all technicalities, fairly minor technicalities. Um, I mean, I just, and I, I, you know, Craig and Joe were also in the court, but I read the response on the part of the prosecution as not willful, uh, but they didn't know. Uh, because remember, the judges kept pressing them more than once on both the First Amendment issue and on the death penalty. And there was one point where one of the prosecutors, remember she just went off in this kind of long, almost incomprehensible diatribe, and I think they didn't know. I don't, I don't think it was intentional. I, I, you were both in the courtroom. I don't know what you think. I couldn't tell. I, I just couldn't tell. Uh, Craig, I'd be interested to know what Craig has to say. I, I was a bit uh, surprised about her reading the Kromberg uh, affidavit on and on, like they had nothing better to say. And uh, on the death penalty, it was uh, pretty extraordinary when Watson, a lawyer for the Home Secretary, actually admitted that they'd never asked the U.S. for the assurance, what they're supposed to do. They never made a request for this assurance. And I was flabbergasted by that. I don't know the explanation, except maybe the one that Bruce is offering. I was um, uh, I was surprised that the prosecution seemed very weak. Dobbit Dobbin in particular seemed extremely weak. Whether she'd actually seemed, although she was the number two, she'd seemed very, very strong and forceful in the old Bailey in the extradition hearings. And um, I found it peculiar. Uh, I, I, and I, I felt she'd lost belief in her own case was the only way it came over to me. But um, it. They could tell they were doing badly, and they were doing particularly badly. And I, um, you know, I can, I can prove this because I wrote it and, and published it. But you know, I, I could tell what this judgment was going to be. It was obvious from the judge's questions, and this judgment was exactly what I, what I predicted it would be. That they would be allowed to leave, a, leave to appeal on these two points only, and, and, and that came over because the prosecution really made, made no effort to answer. But there's, there's one important point we haven't. Um, touched on, I think, and, and that's the, they did take the Yahoo News stuff quite quite seriously because the standard, I, I think Mark Summers argued um, successfully that the standard of proof required in an extradition hearing is like the standard of proof in, in an asylum claim. You're not looking, you're not looking for sort of criminal standard of proof that the evidence is true. You're looking for a balance of probability that has this person proven a, a fear of persecution. Um, and so, they accepted, in, if you like, the basic truths in the Yahoo News report, but then they came to this astonishing conclusion, which I think will go down in British legal history, with a paragraph that says that um, uh, it may well be that the UK was that the United States was planning to kidnap or assassinate Julian Assange, but if we extradite him, they won't need to kidnap or assassinate him, and therefore it is okay which has a piece of legal reasoning. Uh, you know, the, this person was trying to kidnap you, but if we give you to them, then they won't need to kidnap you, therefore it's fine. What well, was absolutely breathtaking. Uh, uh, it, it really is a paragraph I had to read four or five times in order to, to believe it said what it did say. Paragraph 210 of the 66-page document. It's, um, it is an unbelievable statement. Elizabeth, I we interrupted. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Marjorie, I believe, uh, is, oh. has just left us. But uh, yeah, and I, I think that is an amazing, amazing paragraph. And also, I wonder, Chris, you were mentioning um, as well that um, uh, regarding the CIA's attempt to, you know, 
extrajudicially attack Assange. What would prevent the the U.S. Um, basically the deep state going after Assange if he did go back to Australia? If he if he was set free, how how could he ever really be safe? I, I doubt the intelligence community would allow him to ever publish anything, speak out ever again. I, I can't imagine that they would allow that. No, I mean, look, I, I had to cover the CIA as a foreign reporter. I, I watched them work in places like El Salvador, and there it's Murder, Inc. Uh, you know, these are really, you know, they recruit now primarily out of the special forces. Uh, 60,000 members of the U.S. military are part of these special forces, uh, SEALs, Rangers, etc., um, they function really, frankly, as death squads. I mean, that's you, you have to remember the character of the people who are driving this extradition. Um, and, and it's not Biden or the Democrats. Uh, I, I agree with what Bruce and everyone has said, that Biden doesn't want it. Uh, or, I mean, they'd have to really be out of their minds uh, at this point, given how precarious their political situation is. Um, but... Uh, the, the the power of the CIA is such that it is really unaccountable. It it, it is it, it it is a state within a state, uh, and I think it's very clear that they are determined to make Julian pay. And the best way is to make him pay is to, I think, as Craig said, entomb him in Florence for the rest of his life. And I I I I, uh, I, I guess I'm just more pessimistic about where we're headed than others. And I and I I really read the court refusal to give those guarantees as uh, and I of course a lot of it was the in the inflection of their voice that they didn't know. They they weren't prepared to give those guarantees and uh, they were uh, both of the lawyers were not very competent and they they just were on the spot. Uh, and the judges of course pressed them uh, but they didn't have instructions as to whether those guarantees could be provided. And so that's how I read it. They didn't provide them. You know, I'd like to comment on that. The most important issue in these cases is the death penalty. I mean, this is the, in, in English law anyway, this is the starting point of the analysis frequently. I mean, if the death penalty is available, there can be no extradition. No one could be ignorant of that. So it, it shocks, strikes me that any competent attorney would have made that inquiry and been prepared. So that's why I think, in, in a sense, it's almost a setup because it's just so shocking that nobody would make that inquiry. It's almost as if, and they went further than that. They said, well, the Trump administration could impose those charges with a death penalty. So they went further than saying they don't know. They went out of their way to say it could happen. And I, I just can't believe any competent attorney would not have prepared on that one point. It, it's a major issue in extradition. And so, um, at least from England, or the UK rather. So it, it just strikes me as something that was almost set up. Uh, and you see, you see this sometimes in cases where uh, the government wants to get out of a prosecution um, and it, 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 it does things that will let that happen. And everyone kind of goes away. So it's hard to know exactly. You know, Chris is right about the intelligence community's influence, but this might be one way the administration has a fighting back. Um, you know, setting this up as a way of countering the impact, the influence of the intelligence community um, and saying, well, it's not our fault. The court won't extradite. So it, it could be a way of getting around that influence. I don't know if I would blame the lawyer because it was the home, the home secretary who did not ask for these assurances. And I think that's uh, uh, th that's where the authority rests in that question. But let me raise this to. Bruce is the last lawyer standing here. What charge could he get? As um, Chris said, when he gets to the U.S., he could have another charge. He, he was alluded to Vault 7, but where's the death penalty in the Vault 7 leaks? What crime would he have to be charged with in the U.S. to get the death penalty any, besides espionage? Remember, the, the government, well, that's, that's with the charge. But remember, the government's contention is that by disclosing this information, he allowed states hostile to the U.S. and that would endanger American defenses to have information that could achieve that. And, and that's all that it takes to get the death penalty. It, it's important to realize that. 
And so um, they conceivably could charge him. They can pick any number of discharges of information they haven't charged yet and, and charge it in that way. Or they can even seek to amend the existing indictment. Um, the, the obligation to hold back on the death penalty does not arise until after the arraignment. So they're not even obligated under U.S. law to, at this point, um, make a statement on the death penalty. It doesn't even arise yet. And so there's all sorts of opportunities still for that to happen. Uh, and it's, it's more than just a theory, though obviously no one's going to execute Julian. But it, it's, it's, a the, it's a fact that could happen. And, um, and so it's available as a way for the court to deny extradition. And I'll, I'll just stress again, I don't see how anyone can give assurances on the First Amendment defense. And, um, mm -hmm. and there is, by the way, a strain in U.S. law that says the First Amendment does not apply outside the U.S. to persons or actions outside the U.S. Um, and that's another, and that they could be argued that much of Julian's um, actions took place outside the U.S. And therefore, he might not be subject to that defense. So there's, there's a lot of room here for the court to have to deny later or allow further appeal. Now, if you remember when you read the... Uh this 66 page ruling there's an interesting admission by the two judges that they admit that he acted in a political way that it was a protected political act that he exposed criminality uh, but that he was never charged and none of the uh, leaks had to do with a u.s war crime it had to do with this mostly about the informants being put at risk which we know is a lot of rubbish if you know the whole story and we've gone over it so many times but i think it's interesting that the judges admitted that he was acting politically but yet the the that part of the treaty or the act doesn't apply and also that he we're not getting him for war crime they the u.s has charged him with something else so they're not even denying that there were war crimes there i found that interesting i don't know if anybody wants to weigh in on that yeah can i um come in on that yeah. and say that um there's an interesting non sequitur as well in their argument because what they state is that he's being he's only being charged with those publications which contained the name of informants. He is not being charged uh, with any of the publications which exposed criminal wrongdoing by the United States. And and the idea you can remove a sort of holistic view of, of you know the generality of of what was being published and what it exposed and and pick out little elements of that and saying they're the bits he's being charged with. Is, that, that's one thing. But the second thing is it's a complete non sequitur because the argument only works if none of the none of the uh, documents which named names contained evidence of criminality. They're talking as though those are two entirely separate things, that, that the documents that named names contain no evidence of criminality, and the evidence of criminality is all in the documents that didn't name names, whereas, in fact, that's not true at all. There's plenty of evidence of criminality in the documents that named names. So they, they've made this completely false distinction between between the two sets of documents. Well, um, there's oh. only one set of documents anyway, but they, 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 they're claiming that there's no criminality in the documents that name names. I, I think the court has another false distinction also between this idea of political opinion and political offense. I mean, the court acknowledges there's an overlap, as it says, but there, you're, we're parsing really narrow nuances here. And the I think what Parliament did was it got rid of the um, political offense provision because political opinions is broader and embraces more activity. I don't think they meant to say it's one versus the other. And um, this distinction, I mean, the reason one is persecuted for opinion is because that opinion is offending in some fashion. So there's really no real way to justify distinguishing between these two. So in terms of what Craig was saying about, you know, there's really no distinction there. I think there's another area in which the court's looking at a real fiction, this notion that there's somehow a difference between opinion and offense political opinion and political offense. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting. I think they would they didn't prosecute any newspaper. They're prosecuting Julian because he was so effective in drawing attention to these things, uh, to that criminality, Craig, as you're putting it. And I think that's where it's a political prosecution. And I, I'm very glad that they, they pushed on this, um, you know, in, in the final argument, 
recently because it wasn't pressed earlier that much. And it clearly, Julian's the lightning rod that annoys, as Chris Hedges said, uh, the, gov- the, the intelligence community. They're, they're going after Julian because he represents something. And uh, they're not going after the New York Times or any of the others that published it. So I, I, I you know, it, it seems to me that it is a political prosecution one way or the other. And this distinction okay. between offenses and opinions is very narrow and shouldn't even be existing. Don't so, forget, um, Bruce, the New York Times is very useful to the CIA and the other intelligence communities. They're constantly leaking their own stuff to the New York Times. So I don't think they want to alienate the New York Times. Uh, well, also, they never did. You know, they never wanted to prosecute them in the first right. place in, in Pentagon Papers case. But so. Julian is uh, principled about this, and he uh, <laughs> he's not going to help the CIA like the New York Times does. And just to add to Bruce's point as well, the, obviously Assange wasn't the first to publish those names either. I mean, we can the right. old history, we can go over it again, but I found it really infuriating reading the judgment, the way that the, the judges basically stated as fact, it, they implied heavily that he was the only one and that's why he was being prosecuted, et cetera. So. Right. Very good point, Elizabeth. He was not the only one. He was not the first one. As we know, John uh, Young from Cryptom.com, he asked the Department of Justice to indict him because he published the exact same materials before Julian did, and he didn't redact any of the names, any of them, if I recall, and they didn't go after him. So that's a good point. Yeah, by the way, that brings it's up a- selective prosecution. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, wh- why just one and not the others? So- Sorry, Craig, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's okay. The- There's another interesting point that struck me in the judgment. Um where they talk of, uh, where they're relating what what events happened, um, not what events allegedly happened. They're not saying these are allegations. They're saying this is what happened and this is why the charges are, are legitimate. And they state that Julian Assange um, in a chat log, I'm not sure whether chat log is, is a correct description, but that's the description they were, in a chat log with Chelsea Manning exchanged messages, blah, blah, blah. But they say he did that, and not that he was alleged to do that. Um, and as far as I'm aware, it has never been admitted that it was Julian Assange uh, on the end of a chat log. And I, I understand there are several possibilities within WikiLeaks as to, to who it might have been, even if it's admitted it was WikiLeaks. Um, they, um, uh, but they, they, they state as fact things which have not been proven as fact in a in a court of law and which are disputed by the defense uh, and that that struck me as very strange yeah chelsea well, manning has never, has never said that nathaniel frank was assange as far as i know that was the name right, that we don't know that and that's one of the things to be proven if there's a trial but i would defend the court on this point though because for purposes of extradition they have to assume these things happened because they're charged so i think that's why the court speaks that way i i don't think the court is speaking that way to make a prejudgment i think they have to they have to accept that these things happened and they're being chargeable, charged. Uh, I think they have to do that through, in extradition. So I, I would say they're probably not prejudging the facts. They just have no choice. They have to assume those facts are true for this purpose. It's a bit of a fiction. but It does look like they're prejudging, though. I have to agree with Craig. But I think that's a legalistic reason why they're doing that. Well, if there's anything anyone else would like to add, this is the time to do it. Appreciate you all like, coming. I wish I was there in the courtroom with you all. Uh, Sorry, you wish you were? They, mm. I didn't realize that uh, it must have been amazing to see. It was an extraordinary uh, uh, thing to be inside there um, and to witness... I think, um, Craig, you said uh, somewhere else on another webcast that you had a kind of grudging respect for James Lewis, who was the prosecutor in the extradition phase in the first lower court. And don't you think they missed him being there? And why wasn't he there? Do you have any idea? No, I found that um, very strange that he, because the courts go out of their way to schedule um, hearings so that, you know, important the, the lead QCs can be there. Uh, they, they very seldom um, hold a hearing on a date which one of the lead QCs can't 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 make. 
And the fact that they didn't then put up another another top lawyer to replace him, but but just led with the second as such a key hearing, um, seemed to me um, uh, very, very peculiar. I, I, I mean, really quite strange. Yeah, I, I quite, you know, it, it's very hard for us who are activists to understand that you have lawyers who do their job and, and they could equally well be on the on the other side. I mean, Mark Summers, who seemed so very, very, who was so very passionate in his in his arguments, he acts for the government in extradition cases as well. Uh, you know, so uh, that um, uh, that profession is peculiar to those of us who are who, who are activists, and understanding that is sometimes emotionally is sometimes a little hard for us to to process. But I I, I thought with James Lewis. I could see that. I could see he was—he he was actually a perfectly decent person uh, doing a, an, an unpleasant job, if you like. Uh, and I—I I thought he actually did it extremely well. You can tell he's a very, very good, very proficient um, lawyer. It's a unique feature of the British system where the lawyers can be on opposite sides every every day and 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 be a prosecutor one day, a defense another. Can't happen in the U.S. It's illegal. We don't we don't allow it. Uh, if you're a defense lawyer or a prosecutor, you can shift roles, but you can't alternate every day. You know, you, you do one or the other in your career at a given time. Otherwise, we call it a conflict. But in Britain, you know, it happens all the time. You can be in the same chambers and be against each other. And um, it happens all the time. It's, it's something Americans have trouble figuring out as well. So it, it's not just people in the UK. A lot of people here can't get that either. In a way, it makes their system better because, you know, there's a certain ethic in arguing a case for its own sake and not being committed to a, a cause as a lawyer. Greg, I was wondering if I could ask you uh, one last question, because you pretty seem to have a very good knowledge of the difference between the act and the treaty, the Espionage, the Extradition Act and the Extradition Treaty. Uh, apparently it talks about, um, the act talks about returning someone to the requesting country and Assange is not being returned. And the, the act says that it applies to UK citizens and he's not a UK citizen. So shouldn't the international treaty prevail instead? This comes from Kathy Vogan, our, our producer who wrote me this question. Um, the, the extradition act, I think, talks of returning someone to the country because, of course, normally they're being extradited for a crime which has occurred in that country. Um, uh, whereas here you are sending someone to be extradited under a claim of universal jurisdiction, uh, which is a different thing. I'm, I'm, I must confess, I, I haven't read, and um, um, the UK extradition act. Definitely applies to non-UK citizens. Um, so, so that that's um, that that that's for sure. The um, uh, I haven't read the the point on returning. I haven't looked at the language of it. That that that. But I haven't looked. That point hasn't struck me. I, but that would be why, because normally you are returning someone to where the crime was committed in 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 in, 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 in an extradition. Um, the 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 act. The treaty depends on the act, if you see what I mean. The, the, the treaty is an enabling act, which then is an enabling... Sorry, the act is an enabling act, which enables the government then to enter into treaties to to put it into force, um, which again makes the argument that there's a conflict between the two all the more strange, particularly as the act was passed in 2003 and the treaty in 2007 and would have been drafted by exactly the same lawyers. Physically, the same people would have drafted the two things. So the idea that, the, as Bruce was saying, the idea that the reference to political opinion in the act is it means something substantially different to political offence uh, in the treaty when it's the same lawyers who would have done it and passed it and not noticed they were drafting two totally incompatible documents is a is a nonsense it, 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 you know having and um i used to work in the government and i know and, and i've actually 
or on, on completely different subjects, but I've actually been responsible for uh, drafting and signing off treaties. And the uh, and you have a, a clearance procedure which makes it impossible to enter into a treaty which is incompatible with existing legislation. Uh, you know, it would be spotted, but they're, they're, very, uh, they're, they're very strong um, uh, systems in 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 place where you have to circulate any treaty to, to countless lawyers and countless government departments for them to check its compatibility of existing legislation. So the, the argument that the Treaty of 2007 was incompatible with the uh, Extradition Act of 2003 and therefore uh, the, the, its provisions do not apply where they conflict is, it, you know, it, it, it's just a, a total fiction. It's, it's a complete fiction uh, and not even a good fiction. It's just obviously nonsense. Thank you for that, Craig. I think with that, we might uh, call it a night. I want to thank Craig Murray, wherever he is, for coming on our show to just bring his expertise to this issue to Bruce. I'm in Greece, Afrin, Greece today. <laughs> where? Greece? Greece, yeah. Okay, sounds, I hope it's warmer than it is here in London, where it was freezing and raining all day. Bruce Afron is in a sunny, looks like very sunny Princeton, New Jersey, uh, where uh, Chris Hedges is also coming from. And of course, Elizabeth is in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Kathy Vogan is running the whole thing behind the scenes from Sydney, Australia. And this is Joel Lawyer for CN Live saying goodbye and thanks for joining us. And we'll be back to discuss this issue some more, particularly after the 16th of April, which is a deadline for the U.S. to see whether they're actually going to be giving these assurances or not. So again, talk to you then. Bye-bye. Get out your notebook. If you are a consumer of independent news, then the first place you should be going to is Consortium News. And please do try to support them when you can. It doesn't have its articles behind a paywall. It's free for everyone. It's one of the best news sites out there. And it's been in the business of independent journalism and adversarial independent journalism for over two decades. I hope that with the public's continuing support of Consortium News, it will continue for a very long time to come. Thank you so much.